Uh, well, um, I'm Dr. Scott Lively. I am uh, a, uh, I'm just a, a, a sinner saved by grace. And Lord's given me a great bio over the years, but it all started out, I was a, I was the oldest of six children in a Catholic family in Western Massachusetts. A little small town, 5,000 people. And uh, my dad developed a very severe mental illness when I was about nine or 10 years old. And it destroyed our family. He got, he got progressively worse. He, had, he was a, uh, back then they called it manic depression. He was a manic depressive with psychotic episodes. And I retreated from the pain of that. One of the things that was the big problem is, is that uh, he, he sort of focused an intense hostility toward me. I, I don't know why, but it was like a demonic thing. And you know, the image that I have of my father is seeing him glaring at him, at me, over my mother's shoulder as she stood in between us. Right? He, never, he never hit me physically. Uh, but I lived under that, and I retreated into alcoholism at the age of 12. And uh, I got into drugs two years later. I spent 16 years in total bondage until Fe uh, February 1st, 1986. I got down on my knees in a secular alcohol and drug rehab center in Portland, Oregon, and surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. It was, I was on my knees. The, the, it was like the, the Holy Spirit just sort of swept through me like a wind. That, the hair was standing up on the back of my neck. And when I got up, back on my feet, I was healed, completely healed and delivered. I never had another desire to take drugs or to drink ever again. And that's been, I don't know how many years ago that is. I, I have, I'm bad at, uh, at math. I had to take statistics in college uh, because of my math problems. But I got into law school. I managed to, but, but anyway, I know what it's like. And, and this, it wrecked my family. And, and I have an understanding. I never struggled with same-sex attraction disorder myself. But I've struggled with just about every other kind of addiction that you can have. And that life gave me that, uh, that my, my childhood uh, crisis, you know, sort of made me susceptible uh, to addictions. I know all about it. And my, uh, my siblings also suffered. See, I got the least of it, despite the, the intensity directed toward me. I got the least of all my siblings. Two of my siblings became homosexual. Uh, my sister Shelley, who's passed, uh, came out to me uh, when we were in both in high school. And she was the third. And, uh, and I was all for it. I was a, I was a lefty on all the side. And, and even all the way up until I got saved, I, I was far left in all my beliefs. Uh, my my car, auto mechanic was a lesbian, uh, and I was proud of that. And my uh, we, I had this building trades collective that I did. I couldn't hold a regular job because of my alcoholism, uh, but I would uh, I, I did handyman work, and so uh, I, I built up this this building trades collective. And then we got a little office and brought in a reception or somebody to answer the phones. Turned out he was a transvestite. He was dug during the day and Rita at night. And I said, oh, no problem, you know. And, uh, and so, I, you know, my whole background. But, but my sister became a lesbian. I've got a brother that's still in homosexuality out in California. We don't talk anymore. Uh, all three of my other siblings who didn't end up in addiction, uh, none of them have ever married. They don't have any children. In fact, I'm the, well, the, my youngest brother, so it's me and my youngest brother, he has one child, but it messed us all up, right? And so I know what it's like to struggle, and that has been, to whom much is given, much is required, right? When I got up off my knees, I was a changed man, and I had surrendered. That's, see, that's the difference, that the secret to have to recovery, to real victory, is surrender to Christ. You know, what, whatever you hold back to in your own control, that's the thing the devil's going to use to drag you back, right? It, you got to surrender. And I was the only person after a year uh, that was still clean and sober from that recovery. I was, it was a whole cohort of people that was in there. I was the only one uh, who was still clean and sober. I went to, to AA, and Jesus was my higher power, until my former drug dealer 
I met him on, I, I ran into him on a street, uh, on, a, on an intersection, and uh, he pulled up next to me on his motorcycle, and he took off his helmet. When I saw who it was, I said, no, Mark, I don't do that stuff anymore. He said, neither do I. I'm a Christian now. And he took me, we went around the corner to the sobriety club, and uh, he challenged me, how come you're not going to church? And then he took me to Portland Foursquare Church that Sunday. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't miss a Sunday there for the next five years. I got back together with my wife. We were separated, going to get divorced. And, I, and I've been on that track of ministry ever since. I'm sold out to Christ, and I want to do whatever it is that he has for me to do. And I live my life now. I actually designed my life in such a way to have the maximum amount of personal freedom so that I can go anywhere, do anything that the Holy Spirit tells me to do and have no hesitation and nothing blocking it. And that has been the, it's the most incredible, powerful life that you can have. But the ministry that he gave me was fighting the LGBT political agenda. Right? And this is the big struggle in Christendom when you have a ministry like this. Because when you're dealing with the individual, right? when you're dealing with somebody who's struggling with same-sex attraction disorder, then, the, then Christ's command is, to, is to, uh, to, to treat them with grace and love and mercy, right? and, the, and the, the, the heart, the, uh, the soft heart of, of, of someone struggling, even if they're not struggling. Right? But to present the truth to them. But that's a completely different ministry than standing up. So, like I said, I, I did a, a talk last night for the city elders. And I, one of the points that I made in that is, you know, what people do in the privacy of their own bedrooms, it's in terms of public policy, is really none of my business. I wish they wouldn't do it. It's between them and God. Right? I believe in sort of don't ask, don't tell culture-wide in terms of public policy. But if you come out of the bedroom and you come out into society and you want to change all the rules that my children and my grandchildren are going to have to live under, then you're going to have a problem with me. And you should have a problem with every single Christian who stands on the Word of God. Amen? Amen? So you have to be able to separate. Yeah, it's tough to be able to do both things. I've done a lot of ministry with people who are in various stages of recovery from same-sex attraction disorder. Or, or just living with it the best that they can and with the struggles and the temptations. And I, do, I, I did an interview this week uh, on Bot Radio that, about hope, right, and, the, and stories of... I, I actually led my sister to Christ over the telephone. And uh, I was in California. She was in Florida, and she was in crisis, and she confessed to me that she was broken, and I led her to Christ on the phone. And she left lesbianism for a while, then she fell back into it. And later, we were both living in Massachusetts, and they invited me, her and her partner invited me to come and talk to them about Christ. Claudia, the partner, was dying of cancer, and, uh, and, and I went in and I basically confronted them. I said, there's nothing, there's nothing sinful about a platonic friendship of people who, are, who join together against the world because they, you know, they're... They, they can get emotional support from each other. But the sex, the, the, the defiance of God on the, on the one flesh paradigm of male and female, that is, will, will, will really hurt you. And, and you can't, there's no, there's no redemption for that part. And they actually then repented of that and they became celibate. And, then, uh, and both of them died as celibate um, former lesbians who still struggled with the fact that they had no place else to go, right? There's not very many places in this society. And as you know, people who are coming out of, of uh, homosexuality who have turned against that are shunned. They're shunned by the LGBT movement viciously, but they're also treated in some cases like lepers by Christians who just don't understand what it's like to be coming in that situation. People, you know, former alcoholics and others deal with it too, you know, and, and it's just the way things are. But my talk today is about the, uh, the, the um, Equality Act. Now, when, when we chose that topic, that was before the pandemic and, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the Equality Act was relevant uh, then because it was going up and, uh, but right now, it's not relevant for two reasons. One, because the Senate killed it 
temporarily. I mean, they never give up. They, the other side, they never give up. So it's just lying dormant there. But the, but the more impor important reason that's irrelevant is because they have the power now to act as if it's law without it being law, right? And that's what I wanted to read this scripture. This is where we are, really. And this is where we've been for a long time. This is a prophetic scripture from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the work of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder, and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they may believe the lie in order that judgment may come upon all those who have disbelieved the truth and delighted in wickedness. And prophetically speaking, that's where we are. We are, we are in the season of the rise of the, of, of the coming Antichrist kingdom, the age of apostasy when people are turning away from the truth of God left and right. And we've entered a time where I think, we, I think our republic was stolen from us in 2020, that it's gone. We don't have a republic right now. What we have is a, a, a democracy of useful idiots uh, who, are, who are operating a tyranny uh, that, uh, and attempting to consolidate their power. And there's a very brief window of time for us to be able to claw it back while there's still enough of the constitutional infrastructure to be able to rebuild with. But the republic itself is gone as of the, the last election, and we are living under really what's an, an oligarchy, really, of cultural Marxists who don't care. If th this is the season of lawlessness. The law is what they say it is. The law is what they want it to be, and they don't care what the statute says. They don't care what the Constitution says. They obviously they don't care what the Bible says, and, and they don't care what the statutes say. They are should just simply implement the policies that they want without regard for any form, any formalism at all. And that's what we're struggling under. There's no, there's no defense to that except to remove them from power. See, this is a zero-sum game, folks, right? You're either going to have... There's, these are mutually exclusive, contradictory worldviews. You either believe... Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24, that God created us male and female in his image. In his image, two complementary halves of one whole. And therefore shall a man leave his family. A man shall leave his family and cleave unto his wife. And that they shall become one flesh. That's the perspective of God. And in combined with that is his, his unflinching condemnation. A man shall not lie with another man as with a woman. It is an abomination. The harshest word in the Hebrew language. An abomination. There is no common ground. There's no compromise with abomination. You're either going to stand on the truth or you are going to stand with the lie. There is no mixing of the two. It's oil and water. Judeo-Christian civilization rests upon the foundation of the Bible. The, the one flesh paradigm is the foundation of civilization itself. But the work of the devil, the, 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 the goal of Satan, is to bring chaos out of order. And, to, and, and has done that through the so-called sexual revolution. The point of the spear, the core of the core of the cultural Marxist agenda. And really, that's what we're talking about, is, is cultural Marxism. See, let's put this in, in the bigger context, stepping outside of the whole sexual context and, 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 and looking at the, the spiritual uh, realm of, of competing powers in this world and who is going to rule planet Earth, right? We have, we have been blessed for 2,000 years and even longer with the truth of God presented to us first in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament, and civilization being built, being rebuilt upon Abraham as a new start, and, and, uh, and, and all the blessings that have come from that. That's the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's centered on the truth of God. 
And the alternative of that, that has always been attacks on the truth of God from the very beginning. And in the beginning, in the early days, the satanic religions were obvious and crude. Crude and obvious, right? The, the demons, the, the Baals, right? Baal Peor and, and Baal Zebub and all of these, that, that it, was, it was blatant and obvious. But in more recent centuries, the Antichrist agenda, the satanic, um, Satan perfected his religion within the context of Marxism. See, Marxism is the comprehensive alternative to the truth of God. Everything that God states in his word and through his creation is contradicted point by point in, in Marx, Marxism. And that so really, and, the, and, and Marxism itself is sort of the broader, huge worldview in which everything is covered at, in a counterfeit form. And then within that, the religion called secular humanism is the religion of the Antichrist. It's not, it's not Islam, it's not Roman Catholicism, it's not this or that. It's secular humanism. The religion that nobody thinks is a religion. Because the God is you, right? Humanism, where you're the God, right? A million, a billion gods all competing with the holy God by declaring that they... And it's the common denominator in all of the enemies that we face in our society is secular humanism, right? Whether they sit in a synagogue or they sit in a church, or they sit in a mosque, or they sit in a Hindu temple, or, they, or, they, or they're involved in any of the different New Age cults, right? The one common denominator they all have is they're humanists. Yeah. And humanism, this is, the, this, this is what, the, what the challenge is. And when I speak on this topic and I talk about the LGBT agenda, the LGBT agenda, the LGBT doesn't stand, and don't use the Q, by the way, sorry, but don't use the Q. What does Q stand for? No, questioning, questioning, right? If you use the Q, if you, why would we let them claim all the kids that are struggling with sexual identity? Why would we let them claim that and, and go along with and agree they should be over there with them? No way, they belong to us. We need to rescue those kids from that, right? So you know, this is, nobody, this is, Holy Spirit gave this to me like a month or two ago. And I've been talking, nobody has had, I've never heard anybody else say this before, but this is something, this is a way to be able to grab back, right? You got to claw back territory, and that's how we do it, right? We, when, we, when we encounter problems, we, when we see things where the enemy has left a gap, we take the gap, we get back in there. So anyway, this whole idea, LGBT is not just a collection of constituencies, it's a sequence of the dismantling of the created order. Right? If you think of the created order as like a tree, right? That's that's on the foundations. Genesis 1:1, God created in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, right? And then step by step, he built things up. He created us, right? In his image, right? The foundation of humanity, of society, of civilization. Marriage then and he created Eve in the form of a wife. He didn't create her and then make her a wife, he created her as a wife. And then all of the different levels of civilization that, come, that are all rest upon those foundations. So that in the end, you have this glorious tree of life in which civilization is represented. The most, the most refined points of civilization are the tips of the twigs at the end of the branches. And what the LGBT stands for is killing the tree from the tips of the branches back to the root systematically. One thing at a time until you get to the very last. How did the sequence go? Well, what did they attack first? They attacked the sanctity of marriage, right? The whole idea that you shouldn't even need to be married in, in, in order to, to have sex together. That's the essence. And, and then uh, and so this, you, if you track it from like the 1940s to the present, that's what they did. One step after the other, they chipped away at every single thing. And, and, the, and, the, and the sequence of how they did it with the sexual minorities is they started with the one that was easiest, to, the most palatable uh, to the, uh, the, the secular and the, the, the heterosexual population, lesbianism. Lesbianism is the least offensive of them, especially because it's not threatening to men at all. And it isn't even really mentioned in the Bible. It's, sort of, it's, it's extrapolated from biblical truth. 
may make Romans 1 perhaps, although some people say that actually could be talking about sodomy, uh, but whatever. The, um, the, 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 the next is gay, right, male homosexuality. That was harder to, to get the public to go along with, but nevertheless they pushed that. Then they switched to bisexuality. When you talk bisexuality, it isn't just talking about one man and, and one woman. Or, or you're talking about po- really all the different forms of polyamory, polygamy, etc. That one wasn't such a big deal because everybody was already kind of living that way that wanted to. And, and there wasn't as much of a, of a bearer. But then they got to transgenderism. Trans, transgenderism is, is the next to the last part of, in that going back toward the roots, it's the next to the last piece because it's, it's attacking the idea that you're created in God's image, that there is this sort of binary heterosexual reality, right? And, and that by eliminating that, it, cha- it takes away your human identity, right? And, and then so, but that paves the way for the next thing. Behind that T is a hidden another T. Anybody know what that is? It's transhumanism. Right? Because that's the very last thing. What's the first thing that, that God did in the created order? He's, he created the creatures and separated them into kinds. Right? And we're a kind, right? And the scripture talks about, you know, there's a the spirit of, of, of this, the spirit of you know different animals and all that. Right? What is transhumanism all about? Transhumanism is about blending, it's about breaking down the barriers between human and animal. Genetic modification, right? Growing heart, human hearts inside of pigs. You know, they're already doing all this stuff. And then if you, if you, if you have, don't know anything about transhumanism, it's the next thing. It's the, it's the final thing. And there's the, the, the right-hand man of, uh, of Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum is Yuval Noah Harari. He is, I believe, he actually is the best candidate for the false prophet. Uh, biblically speaking, the, in the world today. He is the prophet of transhumanism. He t- speaks very frankly, saying that we've reached the point where we can hack humanity now and make a better form of ourselves, right? That's what, really what they're doing. What, what they're doing with these kids, by, with this whole intense propaganda to change their way of thinking, to in, get them invested in sexual anarchy, uh, and to break free from any Judeo-Christian constraints is they're preparing them to be the guinea pigs of transhumanism because they will already have rejected the idea of that, that, that being human means you're male or female created in God's image and that it means anything that you want it to mean. And all of these movies that we think are just sort of fluff and nonsense about uh, you know, the X-Men and all these different ones about special powers and, spe- and, and all that, that's, pro- that's predictive programming, right? That's not just entertainment. They've been preparing the minds of young people for the time when, it, when, when transhumanism, when the sciences of transhumanism, genetic modification, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, all these have been growing simultaneously at the same time and being intermingled. So, so we, we've reached the place now where we're very close where you're going to be able to, to do designer changes in your own body. And if not your body, then your child's body, right? Because you can edit the genes. But so the whole thing about the virus, this, this, uh, this COVID and all that. I won't get into all the details of it, but this is a big part of it. They messed with our DNA with this. I, I refuse to take it. And, but anyway, that this is all a package. It's the satanic agenda. That's right. And sexuality is the tool that's been used by the devil, right, to be able to change the, the world. And who has been driving the sexual revolution the entire time? People who are wrapped up in a sexual identity that defies God. It's just really, it's just simple mathematics. Two plus two is four. And that's what we've been facing in this country. The United States is the most morally and sexually corrupt country in the world. And that's not accidental. We're the nation that was established on the model of the Israelite Republic. And uh, you know, our republic was formed in 1620 with the Mayflower Compact. And it lasted, you know, the, the Israelite Republic lasted 400 years. And we just lost our republic in exactly 400 years from 1620 to 2020, right? And that, that these things are not accidental. These are not, uh, but so what we happen to be living in this time 
where we're watching all this. And we, those of us in this room, we have special knowledge and insight about all these things. Because we're not observing from the outside of what happens when the sexual revolution overthrows your own sense of identity and enslaves you to some kind of uh, agenda, political agenda. We know that. We know firsthand. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a special responsibility that comes with that. Special insights, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. God has drawn you out, has pulled you out of the miry clay, right? He's pulled you out of the swamp. And you have a job to do. You have to speak the plain truth and not shrink back. And that is uh, what I'm here basically to, uh, to say. How much more time do I have in my... Oh, yeah, that's good. Cool. High tech, man. All right. So <clears throat> there are, uh, I call it five stages of homofascism. Right? And this is what really what we're talking about, is homofascism. And uh, the, the five stages are tolerance, Acceptance, celebration, forced participation in gay culture, and lastly, punishment of all dissenters. That's the, the sequence that we've been following. If you go back to the history of all this, a lot of people, a lot of you may know this history, but uh, the history goes back to really the 1940s. Well, the, the, the LGBT movement really was launched you know who actually they say themselves, the, the, the scholars of the LGBT, say it was uh, the Marquis de Sade actually was really launched the, the, the most fundamental sort of protean form of a movement. But it was really Germany in the 1860s. Carl Heinrich Ulrichs uh, established the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. It's one of his friends that coined the term homosexual. It had always been just be sodomites before that, but they wanted to shift the focus away from moral uh, um, moral weakness to a medical condition. Homosexual was created for that purpose as a term. And then, uh, but his theory was that male homosexuals are really female souls trapped inside men's bodies and that lesbians were just the opposite of that. And, uh, and, and therefore, God made a mix-up. Just like they're teaching the kids in school, this whole idea of what gender are you, right? What the simple response to that the one that, that knocks the entire thing in the head. One simple sentence. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. And all, every single kid needs to hear that. And, we, and whenever you hear anybody talking about, you don't have to, don't get into statistics or any of this, or studies, any of this. Stay away from the soft sciences. Sorry, those of you who are in that field. But look. Uh, that stay away from the soft sciences because they're, the, they're easily manipulated. And we're fighting against all their, their, their nonsense for, dec for decades. Simple statements, right? God doesn't make mistakes. But the beginning of the whole movement, Carl Heinrich Ulrich is saying, yeah, God did make a mistake. And, and we men who struggle with same-sex attraction are sort of really women. And, of course, that wouldn't, didn't go over well with the butch homosexuals. Who, uh, who really violently reacted and then created their own counter-movement uh, in 1902 in Germany, uh, the Gemeinschaft der Eigenen, the community of the elite, right? And these were like super macho, right? Their whole philosophy was that their type of homosexual had been the creators of all the nation-states in the history of the world. And, uh, and then they fought with each other and all that. That was Germany, right? That was, that's, out of that, that's where the Nazi party came from, right? The Nazi party was an outgrowth of the German gay subculture. And the homosexuals who got persecuted by the Nazis were the effeminate ones associated with the communists uh, and, and being persecuted by the butch ones who formed and, and, and ran the, the Nazi party. That's one of my books on my book table out there. If you don't know this history, you really ought to see it. It's really quite something. It came to full fruition. And you know, this whole idea of of, of human rights, right? The theme of, of human rights, that's a pure invention, right? I have a, I have, my minor in law school was international human rights. I mean, you don't really have a minor in law school, but if, if I had, there, that would have been it. And, uh, you know, there's, in the entire history of, of human rights jurisprudence, just none of that, it's nonsense, to completely no connection at all with sexual 
uh, deviance is never a, considered a human right until modernly, and it all comes out of the LGBT movement. Carl Heinrich Ul Ulrichs had a petition going to repeal the sodomy laws. Uh, the, uh, the, the paragraph 175 of the German legal code criminalized homosexual sodomy. And so they had a petition going, they were attacking that, and then in the by the 1920s, it was dominant. The Weimar government, it, it, was, it was like San Francisco on steroids. The whole country, the, the cities were, were just overrun. It's unbelievable. And, uh, and in the midst of all that, this group forms uh, called the Society for Human Rights. And you know who the most prominent member of the Society for Human Rights is? Ernst Röhm, the head of the Sturmabteilung, the brown shirts. <laughs> He's the most prominent member of the Society for Human Rights. And one of, uh, a, a German-American soldier who struggled with homosexuality was there in Germany uh, as part of the American contribution to the post-World War I activities over there. And then he came back to the U.S. December 10th, 1924, he formed an American chapter of the Society for Human Rights in Chicago. And, uh, and it was the first open homosexual organization in the United States it didn't last very long because him and his two buddies got arrested for molesting teenage boys. It got disbanded. But one of those three men molested another guy named Champ Simmons. And Champ Simmons, when he became an adult, he recruited Harry Hay into the homosexuality. Harry Hay then became the father of the American gay movement and uh, you know, a teacher of Marxism for 18 years before he formed the Manichean Society. Uh, who organized the, 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 uh, the gays into secret cell groups and targeted the, um, you know, with the goal of transforming society. Right? So remember, this is systematic, this is planned, this is, and it's all, at the core, cultural Marxism. Right? Four forms of Marxism, by the way. Communism, socialism, German-style fascism, right? all centered on economic strategies for overthrowing Judeo-Christian civilization. And then the Frankfurt School, Herbert Marcuse, pioneers cultural Marxism, which shifts the focus away from economics to culture and attacks the natural family. And, and that, that has been the most successful. That's the form of Marxism that dominates the United States and the EU. And that's what we're really fighting. But, but anyway, this, um, <clears throat> this uh, movement by you know, Harry Hay, and they came, their, their goal was they're going to bring about uh, sexual freedom in the, in the culture. How are you going to do that in the 1940s? You know, if you actually went out in public and said you were going to go into the public schools and you're going to start teaching the kids that, uh, that they can choose any gender that they want and they should experiment with sex with each other, you would have been killed, literally, in the 40s if you had done something like that. No way that that's going to happen. So how are you going to get to the place where the whole society now gets turned on its head and now embraces your agenda, right? You have to get the heterosexuals dirty in the deal, right? You have to first get heterosexuals to abandon sexual morality. And that's what they started with first. They weren't out there, you know, they did some pro-homosexual stuff, but they pushed for uh, the change in the culture. That's where, you know, Kinsey comes right directly out of that. Alfred Kinsey, uh, uh, 1948, sexual behavior in the human male, all those fraudulent studies purporting to show that Americans are far more devious and deviant uh, than anyone was admitting, uh, you know, pushing the envelope. Meanwhile, Hollywood is attacking the sanctity of marriage, right? Pillow talk, the seven-year itch, you know, Rock Hudson, in-the-closet homosexual. Uh, all this stuff is strategic. It's intentional. And it, and it works, right? Kinsey's followed immediately... Uh, or even in Kinsey starts, then immediately Hugh Hefner jumps in with the, with the modern porn industry, right? Launching Playboy magazine. He called himself Kinsey's pamphleteer, right? He took this idea. Kinsey was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation to go to all the elite universities across America and to get the top, and they're mostly young men at, in those days, uh, to get all these young men to sell them on the idea that they don't have to, to use sexual self-restraint. <laughs> How hard is that, right? To get uh, 18, 19, 20-year-old men to throw off any restraint and say, well, you can have sex with as many women as you want, and you're actually going to be doing society a good thing. Because, you know, the, real, the reason we have sex crimes 
is because, uh, because our society represses sexuality. And if we just got rid of the repression, there'd be no rapes, there'd be no, none of this other stuff, right? So you're doing a good thing by th overthrowing that and just indulging yourself, right? And, that would then, and then Kinsey put pictures to it, right, for the blue collar, and we're off to the races, right? Uh, women, the women's movement is sort of following behind all that, and then they would say, like, hey, what about us, right? Because women, as, as long as women were holding the line, they couldn't go anywhere, right? If women, aren't, if women aren't in agreement with sexual promiscuity, there's not much that the men can do unless they're going off with other men. So the, the, the lesbians infiltrated the women's movement. Women's movement was pro-life. Women's movement was Christian. Remember the temperance union and all that? It, was, it, was, it came out of, the, the, of a desire to stop alcoholism in men that was destroying families. But lesbianism uh, got involved in that, and all of a sudden... All, so all of a sudden, the women are saying, hey, we want to be able to do what the men are doing, right? And once that, boom, phew, explodes, 1960s. And, uh, and, and then they, so the unraveling of, a, of sexual morality proceeds, and the Supreme Court is involved at this point. Now, I don't know how many people realize how deep the deep state goes and how long it goes, but our U.S. Supreme Court has been a tool of the globalists for a long, long time and that you have this series of court cases all the way back into the 1960s that tracks the disintegration of our moral culture, right? 1966, Griswold versus Connecticut, contraception on demand. Now, I don't have the Catholic view on contraception, but the only reason that we've got contraception on demand is to facilitate fornication as of social value, right? And because people don't always use it and it doesn't always work, you've got to have a backup system, which is abortion. 1973, Roe v. Wade, which we're about to see fall, God willing. But it's only going to turn it back to the states. It's not going to solve the problem. We're still going to be fighting. We're going to be fighting at the state level instead of the federal level. But anyway, and then, uh, you know, by this, by this time, the, the, the LGBT movement at the beginning sort of hid behind this tolerance thing, right? I'm all for tolerance, right? Don't ask, don't tell. That's my philosophy. You know, between you and God, what you do... If I will help you in any way I can to break free, right? But if you keep it in the bedroom in terms of public policy, no problem. And that was the slogan, right? Dale Jennings of the Mattachine Society coined the term the right to be left alone. That was the pursuit up until, uh, and, but, and, and Marcusa is now, he's going all over. He's at the top strata. He's the golden boy of, of American intelligentsia promoting the idea. What did Marcusa in cultural Marxism say? He said that the that the the real threat, the real barrier uh, to, um, uh, to to Marxist control is the um, uh, the repressive order of procreative sexuality. Right. So that's what that's what's got humanity in its grip. This repressive order of procreative sexuality, men and women getting married and having babies. Right. That's the enemy. That's that's what must be broken. And he said the way to do that, see, all of this philosophy boils down to these, these two sentences, right? Uh, the repressive order of procre procreative sexuality and then the, the solution, the elimination of the monogamic and patriarchal family, right? Monogamy and male authority in the home, right? Radical feminism comes out of all this and all that. Anyway, the, by the 1960s, the LGBT leadership had, was ready to actually change, to, to leave tolerance behind and go immediately for acceptance and that they weren't going to be deterred in any way. Stonewall riots, June 28, 1969, anniversary of Gay Pride Day, right? They go full militant, right? The, uh, the, the police show up to arrest an underage drag queen boy at the Stonewall Bar, the mafia-owned bar in, on Christopher Street in New York. And then, the, and then the, uh, the, the radicals turn on the police, drive them out of the bar, then drive them back in and try to set it on fire. All right? That's the roots of, of Gay Pride Day. And, uh, and that was the turning point when they shifted from tolerance and began actually the pursuit of total cultural and political hegemony. hegemony. And that's where we are right now. And over the course, I'm down to 34 seconds. Uh, Anthony Kennedy, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, the worst enemy of the family in the history of the court, wrote all four majority of opinions actually accomplishing that. 
the final one being Oberg Ober Ober Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015. That's paved the way for everything that's happening right now. I've got a lot more that I could share with you. I'll do it in the breakout sessions. And, uh, you know, I've got books on my book table. I encourage you to get on my newsletter. Uh, and uh, I thank you all for being here and for supporting this ministry. Uh, it's absolutely essential that we provide hope for people uh, at this time when they say there is no hope, that it's not possible to, to come out of, to, it's not possible to reorient your orientation, your sexuality, to, the, to, to match the design of your physiology. They say that. And it's so bizarre, right, that, that what they're pushing for in the schools is this, this self-determination for children, for six months olds, right? Three-year-old, six-year-old, ten-year-old. Self-determination for them. They, at that age, right, and with no knowledge of the world, they can declare whether they're a boy or a girl today. And then, once they've done that, they're locked in, right? And you sign them up for the genital mutilation, right? That the bizarre, the insanity of that mindset, when, at the exact same time, that exact same movement is pushing to criminalize same-sex, uh, um, you know, counseling, right? You can't, if you have already declared that you're LGBT, you can't change it. And, and, and we're going to prevent you from even trying with laws. That's, you know, that's the satanic agenda. The devil always says good is evil and evil is good. So I'm, I'm over time. God bless you. And I'll see you in the breakout sessions.